Leticia and I wrote I need help. Um, the inspiration I'd say or the drive was a need to address mental health in relationships. Um, I think a lot of the time it's something that's avoided or people choose to not um, relate to it or um, I don't know, they choose to not associate with mental health, meanwhile, something that they're going through, something that they brush off. So this was a way of telling a lot of people's stories, some of mine included, um, so that they can relate to it and know that there are other people that are going through it and that um, there is a positive side, like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, at the end of the day. One of the cool things about that sort of light at the end of the tunnel that you kind of leave it up to them. You don't like, they don't have a revelation where they're suddenly okay. <laughs> because there's always a choice. I think life is a choice. There's always a choice. You get to, like it's, obviously it's the beginning to um, admit that there is something wrong or that there's progress that needs to be done. There's improvement that needs to take place. But actually taking the steps for that to happen is another thing. So there's always a choice at the end of the day and that's up to the person watching or the person going through that story to get help or to just keep going the same way they've been going. Um, the one sort of last thing I wanted to ask um, was why did you pick this sort of conceit? Because you have them kind of in separate rooms having this kind of conversation with the audience as if we're sort of like, they know we're, they're sort of talking to us as much as they're talking to themselves. Um, what was the, what made you interested in sort of like you exploring that kind of setup? Um, I think a lot of people going through these um, situation, experiencing these circumstances, usually don't have people to talk to, or they maybe just don't feel comfortable making that step to talk to someone. Um, I talk to myself <laughs> sometimes. So I just felt like that's the first way to do it. It's actually one, you're having that conversation. And if you can't speak to someone, maybe speaking out loud, out loud and having that exchange. Um, it's just, and I don't know. And some people say that you are, um, I forget, what is it? Um, oh, at least I say sometimes when I speak to myself that I need to get, um, an expert's opinion, like I'm considering myself the expert. So I don't know. It was just sometimes I speak to myself. Sometimes I do it out loud. Sometimes I just do it in my head. So it was a way of putting your thoughts out there. But this way, like your thoughts are a speech. Your thoughts are what people get to hear, what they get to experience. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alexandra Porter, and I wrote Let's Make Something Good. So when we joined this project, the goal was to talk about the ends of relationships. And at that point in my life, I had had a lot of kind of conclusions or things coming to a close, relationships ending, uh, jobs moving, what have you. And I was at a point where I was seeing everything as uh, a negative. All the endings were bad. I kept holding on to it. Um, and after coming up with way too many really depressing ideas, I decided to try and challenge myself and see the end of something as something potentially good, that finishing one thing can be the start of another. Um, so in relationships, a lot of people say that the, the goal or what they would aspire to have is a relationship that is based in friendship that starts there and grows into something else. So kind of playing with that moment where you choose to forego what the relationship was in order to pursue what it could be is where I landed. In the kitchen. In the kitchen to make something good. <laughs> what, why did you pick cooking? Like, what was the thing about cooking that was like, why is that the place that I want to have this introduction happen? Yeah. Um, well, I, first of all, it's the, the imagery of creating something together and making something that nourishes 
the person that you're with. Um, I love cooking myself. It's a passion of mine. And one of the many ways that I show my love to people, um, if I'm having people over, if I'm going somewhere, I, I love to take care of them and cook for them and just kind of force food on people as a means of caring. Uh, so I kind of took that passion and brought it into this space where this other couple can be doing something together that requires them to cooperate and create and just kind of spend that intimate time together of eating. Yeah. The one sort of interesting thing, because you do this whole journey and they kind of get to sort of with the end mm -hmm. of that emotional arc, and then yeah. you just escalate it by having one of them move to Europe to do a PhD <laughs> in Zurich. Um, yes. And I just want to wonder, I wonder what the reasoning behind that choice was, because it's a cool way of like going, and here's the first <laughs> thing we have to deal with as a new couple. So what was like, what was your sort of like, what was your reasoning behind that moment? Yeah. Uh, well, kind of my first approach, uh, my approach to a lot of my writing is just that I want it to be really real. Um, and in life, there is, there's no good timing for things. There's always going to be a challenge. Um, there's no such thing as just an easy happily ever after. And I didn't want that cliche romance. Um, again, I think at that point in my life, I was going through a lot of changes and a lot of the people in my lives were going through changes of, of moving and choosing careers. Um, so it was just a very prominent kind of idea in, in my life of external challenges that influence your relationships and then choosing how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and because Finn and Avery have been in each other's lives for so long, you know, they're able to look at this potentially catastrophic problem for the two of them yeah. and just be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to take the leap of faith and I'm going to jump with you and we're going to try and make this work. Hi, my name is Helena Chichura. I wrote It's Alive and Rooftop. Um, the reason that I wrote two pieces is because I think I don't know when to stop. Um, I just have the too much gene and I just, I'll just keep, I'll just keep doing it until someone tells me to stop doing it. So that's why I wrote two. Um, I think initially we talked a lot about like types of relationships because we were focusing on the ending of relationships. Um, and so it was like, what? what are the what's the huge gauntlet of types of relationships that there are um and I had like five or six different types in my brain that I was like these are all cool and interesting I wonder how these will work um and then eventually narrowed it down to two um again because I have the too much gene and um specifically those two I think the uh for rooftop I had done um a I'd written a play before about um I think it was it was called Lesbians in the Apocalypse um and it was about two girls being like the last people on earth after a, a zombie apocalypse and like it was about being like how do we repopulate the earth if we're both gay and we're both women and like well we might as well try like that kind of thing so it was just like this little like dark comedy about um lesbians in an apocalypse so um, it was that kind of mixed with a um, fascination with people having surface level conversations in serious contact. So like if you talk to people that have like gone through like extreme crises or like war and things like that, they'll still be like, oh, but like I still like was worried about what my eyebrows looked like or like, oh, like I was still worried about what that boy I liked thought of me. Um, and like the kind of surface level conversations you have to cover up the big bad of the world. So that those two kind of combined um, was where Rooftop came from. It's Alive kind of came from just a, a spooky, dumb existentialism are like my favorite things. This, this, those three things are my favorite things of the world. So I was like something spooky, something dumb, something nihilist. Um, how do I combine that in a relationship where 
the ending of a relationship is less of like um, an emotional one and more of like a ending of a relationship with the world um, and each other. So spooky, spooky dumb nihilism was is the inspiration for <laughs> It's Alive. That was a short answer, wasn't it? As an actor, I'm always looking for the weird human things that happen in a character. So like my favorite thing is like when, are, when people are having like a serious argument and someone sneezes, like just like the things that you can't control that are weird and they just, they're just, they're going to happen. Like you can't, um, you can't get away from it. So like for me, what's interesting and how I try and write my dialogue specifically is natural in a way that's kind of a little oversharing natural um because that's what makes it extra human mm -hmm. in quotation marks because not everybody's human in this yeah well, yeah and like the world's absurd and humans are absurd and so I think it's like the natural absurdity rather than like the constructed absurdity that I find interesting is like everyday humans are really weird so that kind of absurdity So what was the inspiration that drove you to wrote uh, Rudy's Dad Dies Twice? It's a great question. I don't really know myself. I mean, so part of this is inspired by my own life as a teenager a bit and then trying to make it super, <laughs> just like take it and toss it off a cliff um, in terms of um, how, how these people feel about each other. Um, but I also think that um, a lot of it just had to do with um, I don't know what I was trying to get out of writing, writing a, a, a play. Um, I went through a lot of iterations of ideas around it. I wanted to be sung through at one point, um, not with this script, but I was really into the idea of people, people talking about death and having it be sung through and then maybe following up in heaven, um, with Jesus there. And I, I just thought there was a lot of, <laughs> I had many an idea and it ended up being whittled down to this. Um, I also think COVID played a role. Sometimes I, I look back at my piece now and I'm like, geez, this is like this is way sadder than I usually like to write. I think if I wrote something now, it'd be completely different and I would not have gone here. But that's kind of the interesting thing about like the state of the world and COVID as well is that like, I don't know, I was feeling my feels at this point, you know, like probably somewhere expecting a lockdown and not seeing people and just like having a lot, a lot of time to think about your life. And I was like, okay, well, let's write something about that then. Like, let's let's mine some of the experiences where you lay lay in bed and you're like, mm, you know, you're just like yeah. in bed at night. And you're like, <laughs> why? Um, and let's 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 talk about those things. I make some up as well, but you know, let's yeah. just let's just write them down. I had an iPhone note. I just had like a list of shit that made me uncomfortable. And I was like, great, we're just gonna try and <laughs> warp these into something to put in the play. Awesome. And uh, that's what I did. <laughs> What drove you to the sort of the clim choosing the subject of the climactic conversation, how they get into that final engagement between each other before the end of the play uh, between Rudy and his dad? Um, I was reading a book and then I said that Rudy was reading a book um, and I read that chapter and I thought it was really silly that people had this idea about um, their testes and I turned over to my partner and I told her all about it and then a while later I was in the shower and I was trying to think of a way to end the piece and like have some sort of emotional catharsis but also like and talk about the ideas of like just feeling really shitty about everything that you've done in life and uh, but even though you shouldn't feel guilty because you're just a human being and I don't know I was in the shower and it just kind of came I was like what if I just like ripped that off what if I just took that and tried to tie it together and it took me like six drafts to like maybe make it make a bit of sense um but I was just kind of interested in in writing something that was pretty silly but also uh, pretty silly coming out of their mouths but for each of them carried emotional weight behind it um it was just to me cracked me up so um yeah that's that's why I chose it I'm just an avid reader so what was like the um driving thing that inspired the piece that you wrote? Um, I think uh, in my other life, I write songs for a band uh, called Adult Recreation Center. 
Um, and one of the things that I do a lot in art is sort of like express my feelings because that's what a lot of songwriting is and sort of filter those experiences through art. And um, I wanted to talk about what that experience was like and what those motivations were like, because I think it's a really interesting question for me at the time uh, of like sort of coming out of school and into sort of becoming a more career focused artist and going, why do I write about this stuff? And what's the reasoning behind that? And why does it feel like something I need to do? Not necessarily something I like always want to do, because there are much bigger problems in the world than, you know, having a bad date. But there are these ideas that like, um, you can't escape sometimes and artists sometimes the only way to express them. So I wanted to look at that and sort of explore that theme whilst being, you know, somewhat self aware about how uh, self aggrandizing that theme can come across as mm -hmm. this piece you wrote mm -hmm. following a breakup in your own personal life. Mm -hmm. And so it was very much of the time. Yeah. And very much like now Does that come across <laughs> <laughs> very subtly. Um, uh, like a year later, from when you were writing it ish, like just under a year later, um, how would you approach the piece differently? Or, or, or do you have different thoughts on how, where you would have taken it if you were examining the same subject, but now a little bit more removed from the emotions of where you were a year ago? I, I think that if I was going to do it right now, um, yeah. cause I tried to do it the first time. So the thing about that piece, and it's not necessarily a thing I'm proud of, but the thing about that piece is the first draft is sort of the play within a play. Like that, I was the first attempt I had at writing and I didn't want to write it. Like that was not what I set out to do. I wanted to avoid that kind of, I wanted this to not be about that, but it was an experience that sort of then inspired the sort of meta play of like, how, why did I have to do that? Why did that have to come out of me? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the exact thing I wrote. I sort of amped up and picked and cherry picked some of like, and try to find the worst in it because I wanted it to feel gross mm -hmm. a little bit um, and sort of like a bad experience of like, why are you talking about this? This feels like a deeply unpleasant experience for the audience. Um, um, and that was the idea I wanted to explore um, a little bit. Um, but if I was going to do it now and like approach that experience right now, I'd probably actually write the play within a play, mm. but it would be a lot, it would be a lot softer. I think it would be a lot more, you know, informed by time and a little more like understanding of like being less about an emotional like eruption and more about like, how would this conversation actually go and not taking the worst sort of, which is obviously what I did in like for effect in the sort of final version. What, yeah. What's not the worst version of this conversation? What's the conversation that would be like, what's the complicated conversation? What's that experience like? Yeah. Um, versus sort of like, what's the absolute kind of worst that this could go? <laughs> and how would be the worst way to put that on stage, which is what ends up in sort of like the play within a play. One of the big selling features of this whole project was that we have two actors in all the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you inserted yourself into your piece. Uh, can you explain a little bit behind that decision and why you decided to go off format? I think when I got to the end, I needed a button. I needed something that was like, how does this end? Because this is not how this ends. They're not done. They have to do this play. Um, and I think it was sort of, you needed the writer to lose being a specter because he's sort of this like background character through the whole thing that they're sort of like talking about and like don't seem to know very well and are just kind of like trying to like figure out why they're having to put themselves through this. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, making him real sort of like traps him, traps them in his sort of, there's a line early in the play, earlier in the play, um, where Sarah's character goes, just like constantly revising your own trauma. And I'm like, he's trapped them in that cycle of like rehearsal. And so that sort of like, can we start from the top kind of loops you back to the beginning of that scene and like gets you in those like prescriptions um, and having that be a director talking, um, writer, director, character, whatever, um, felt like sort of the way to do that. Um, it was, yeah, it was definitely like a choice. And I thought about it. Like I was, I was like, do I want to do this? And I kind of thought it was funny. And then when we were talking about it, I was like, that means like someone has to say that and there has to be a new voice 
in the play for the first time over the course of the whole show. Um, so I did have to like sit there. I'm like, is that worth the sort of theme I was going through? And ultimately, that's not for me to decide. Um, but that was sort of the reasoning behind it was to sort of like bring that person into life and may, and then like force them back down the road. Nice. And Sandy, before we go, for the fans, all the fans out there, can you deliver your iconic line that closes the show? Hey, uh, sorry I'm so late. There's a really long line at Subway. Um, can we go from the top? <laughs>